So I am Nancy Campfield, president of the Rancho Bernardo Historical Society. Uh, last night I got a text late from Vince saying his wife had a gallbladder infection and had to go to the hospital. Ooh. So could I do something about today? So since I turned this over to Vince three, a couple of years ago, I knew what to do. So we have wonderful people who set up for us. I knew our, our guests who would be here. So it was pretty plug and play. We're very fortunate and we're so happy to see you all here today. I would like to uh, ask you if you would mind turning your cell phones to mute or vibrate just because you know how disconcerting it can be when someone's speaking and all of a sudden they're listening to Brahms or something. Okay, so I have a little bit of notes because last minute and all. Uh, so um, I told you about that. Uh, we have a photographer who is uh, uh, photographing uh, or I should say videotaping the presentation and then he puts them on YouTube. So anytime you miss one of our talks or you hear that we had a speaker like this gentleman uh, on another occasion and you would like to see the talk, you can just go right ahead and check that out. Our next program is August 12th. We will have at 11 a.m., same as today, uh, we will have uh, Marilyn McPhee, who is a historic storyteller. We had her once before, and she's just delightful. You know, she tells these uh, amazing stories, but in such so vividly and in the present that you're really hooked. So I hope that you will make a note of that. Uh, and then I would like to tell you our speaker today, Mark Carlson. Uh, he is uh, going to give us a talk on Palomar, Bridge to the Stars, which I'm sure you know that. And his friend, uh, Alan Kirk Kutzinger, I knew I was going to stumble on that, uh, will also speak on Palomar Mountain Fire Lookout Towers. And uh, let's see, uh, Mark is a speaker, historian, writer, and has brought his guide or dog, Saffron, to accompany him here today. So I hope you enjoy the presentation. If you have any questions at the end, I'm sure Mark will be happy to, to accommodate you. And with that, I'll get out of the way. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me back today. Yes, I do want to plug my friend Alan to keep my ride. And <laughs> he, uh, he will be talking for a few minutes after I do my presentation about the firewall station of Palomar, which has a fascinating history in itself. So, I'm going to start this talk with a question. What does a measuring cup have to do with the scale of the universe? Quite a bit. And I'm going to tell you that story right now, and then I'll answer that question. So I'm going to show you my PowerPoint, and we'll get on with it. It really starts with a man named George Ellery Hale. George Ellery Hale was a Midwesterner of a wealthy family who was from an early age, something of a dilettante, he got involved in a lot of things in science. He was very curious, he was very interested in learning as much as he could, but astronomy, particularly solar astronomy, became his true love. And even in his teens, he was already building telescopes, making them bigger and better, being able to see farther and farther into the universe. Because even at the beginning of the 20th century, the universe as we know it today didn't exist. We didn't have any clue as to how big it was. In 1921, this is it. This was the entire universe. We didn't know that the Milky Way, the band of stars that you see in the middle of the night, was only one galaxy. In fact, the word galaxy was not even in general use at the time. They were it was assumed that everything was with one great big lump, and that even the small spirals and worlds and nebula that were seen in the best telescopes were just part of this galaxy. <laughs> and so it sparked a debate that uh, was really the catalyst to what led to the building 
of the Hale Telescope. It really starts out when the National Academy sponsored a debate at the Smithsonian Institution between Heber Curtis of the Lick Observatory in San Jose and Carlo Shapley of the Mount Wilson Observatory above Pasadena. These two men were invited to speak about the scale of the universe, and Hale was the one who prompted that idea. How big is the universe? How far can we see? What do we know about it? Well, Heber Curtis and Harlow Shapley were about as different as you could get. Harlow Shapley was very much one of the new astronomers. He was young and brash, very opinionated, and he had access to the biggest telescopes in existence at the time, the 60 inch and 100 inch reflectors on Mount Wilson. And he had ideas that the band of sky, what we call the Milky Way, in that was visible in, in the larger telescope, was only one of what he called island universes, and that there were many, many others. Heber Curtis, who was one of the old school astronomers, he still worked wearing a suit and a bow tie, and freezing all night long in, and he worked at the Lick Observatory in San Jose, which was a refractor, a 24-inch refracting telescope. And he couldn't see quite as far, but he preferred it was convinced that the Milky Way was it, and the universe wasn't nearly that big. So they went up, they had this debate, and among the people in the audience was someone who had recently gained some fame a few years before, Albert Einstein. So this was a pretty big deal. And the newspaper said, this debate will finally answer the greatest question of cosmology. Well, it didn't. All it did was add a lot more questions. And that's where Hale really began to get interested in finding a way to see farther into the universe. And people like Edwin Hubble, a name I'm sure you recognize, and Milton Humanson, who were working with a 100-inch reflector, were, at that time, taking spectra of distant galaxies, the farthest away that you see, sometimes as many as a billion or two billion light years away. And they were taking these spectra and looking and realizing that they were seeing a red shift in the spectra, which indicated that the galaxies were moving away. They were all rushing away from one another, and this led to the theory of the Big Bang. This was the first time that term turned up. It was obvious that the existing telescopes were not up to the job because there was many things farther and farther out that it simply couldn't resolve, and they needed something larger. So George Hale got a bee in his bonnet and decided he wanted to find something bigger, to build a bigger telescope. Now he had already shepherded in the existence of the 36 inch Yerke reflect refractor at uh, William Bay in Wisconsin. And he had also helped to build the 60 inch and 100 inch reflectors on Mount Wilson, the biggest telescopes in the world. But the 100 inch telescope had one major flaw. The, re the reflecting mirror, 100 inches in diameter, actually was made out of plate glass that was made by a French term named Saint Cobain. And they couldn't melt enough glass in their tank to do the entire mirror in one pour. They had to do it in three instead of four. And this created something of a layer cake in the actual telescope mirror. So it had layers of bubbles in it and was not very good at handling temperature changes. And you know that you know, after it's been sitting all day and then they open up the dome, you have to wait for the temperature for the, for the telescope to reach a stable temperature so that the optical image that it collects will be clear. And unfortunately, it had all kinds of teething problems. The mount was shaky, it vibrated a lot. Sometimes the astronomer had to literally shake and twist and bang at it to get it to behave properly. So it was a step in the right direction, but it was obvious that the biggest problem was what the mirror should be made of. Because plate glass was not going to work for a much larger telescope. 
So the Rockefeller Foundation and the Car Carnegie Institution of Washington were batting back and forth about whether to fund this idea, and Carnegie went to Hale and said, all right, I know you want to build a bigger telescope. How big do you want it? How, much, how big do you want it? How much money do you need? And so Hale said, well, he was already thinking he'd like to build a 300-inch, but that was clearly impossible. So he decided to be a little more reasonable, and he asked for a 200-inch telescope. Now, a 200-inch telescope is not automatically going to be two times larger than a 100-inch. It's going to be cubed. It'll be four times larger. And a 100-inch telescope has a, it weighs 100 tons. A 200-inch telescope would weigh 500 tons. And so he decided to stick with 200 inches, and after the, uh, the money man went back and forth, at last, the Rockefeller Foundation granted a $6 million grant for the building operation of a 200-inch telescope that would be the most perfect that we could possibly make it. Now, $6 million at that time, in 1928, was this is just, just before the Depression. This was a huge amount of money. It was the largest grant ever made for a scientific instrument in history. So George Hale had this blank check, and he was off and running. But before they could even consider building a telescope, they needed to know if they could have a mirror. You need to have a mirror. No mirror, no telescope. Well, he went to General Electric, because he had heard that Elihu Thompson, the, the director of General Electric, and had been working with a fused quartz system in which powdered quartz would be sprayed, it would be melted in extremely hot ovens and burned and sprayed onto a rotating surface and built up in layer after layer after layer. Now quartz has an incredible coefficient of expansion and it can be heated up doesn't matter. The heat of the day or the cold of the night, it doesn't matter. It won't change its shape. And so quartz seemed like the ideal material to, to make the mirror. And so when he went to GE and said, I need an 11 inch blank, a 22 inch blank, two 60 inch blanks, a 100 inch blank, and a 200 inch blank, how much will it cost? So after they worked out the detail, they said $252,000. That's very reasonable. So they got to work, and work, and work. Two and a half years. They went way past that two and a half, that $250,000. And all they managed to do for experimentation and uh, testing and trying and failing and having all kinds of problems, it became more and more obvious that the fuse quartz idea wasn't as much a godsend as Hale and Hope. They managed to make one 11 inch blank and two failed 60 inch blanks. And it ended up costing $639,000. One tenth of the budget for the telescope was already eaten up for failure. So Hale was pretty disgusted that he lost so much money and lost more than two years of time and still did not have the mirror. The <coughs> ovens and the burners and the liquid ammonia that had to be burned uh, just to make the 200 inch blank, the amount of liquid ammonia that they needed to burn would have required 10,000 tank cars, railroad tank cars of mm -hmm. liquid ammonia to fire the burner to make a 200 inch mirror. And they were nowhere near the, uh, the level of reliability that would make it happen. So at last, in 1933, Hale pulled the strings on GE and said, we're going to try something else. He had learned about a new process. <coughs> he went to Corning in New York. But they were working with an innovative boral silicate glass that seemed to have a wonderful coefficient, coefficient of expansion. And even though it was glass, it was a better glass than a plate glass used in a 100-inch mirror. And 
their chief scientist, a man named George McCauley, was a very careful, methodical experimenter. He did everything on a small scale to prove the technology, to prove the profit, and make sure everything worked before he went up. And he kept everything itemized. He didn't do anything on a large scale until he was sure it would work. And he actually had the idea that this mirror could be cast using an old, very old technique of ladling. Ladling large amount of liquid glass, molten glass, out of a tank and pouring them into the mold by hand. Even on the scale that he was talking about, it still seemed reasonable. So he did it on a small scale. He had no trouble with the 11 inch, with the 22 inch, the 60 inch, every one, everything came out perfectly. And each time he learned a little bit more about the type of brick to use, what type of glass to use, how much he would need for the ladle, everything. And then he decided to go for the big one. And he had a big mold kiln made, a great big kiln that was large enough to contain the mold and the heating element to keep it liquid until it was ready to be put into the annealing oven. And they built out of refractory brick. This is a photograph showing part of the mold cores for the rear of the telescope disc that has a beautiful wobble pattern. And these were carved out of refractory brick and put together into the, the mold and placed into the mold kiln. By this time, a year has gone by, but he already proven it can be done. And he developed a system where he would have this mix, mixing, uh, molten glass tank with about the size of a swimming pool. And it would hold about 40 tons of molten glass. And it had doorways set in the side of it. And the ladler, which had these huge ladles that were on the wheel, each one would hold 750 pounds of glass, would roll their ladles toward the tank, dip them in, fill them up, and move them back down the track into one of the three doorways into the oven. And it would pour them. And this way, the pouring points would be staggered at 120 degree point, and it would, it would label it out flat. This is something he worked out over the full year and getting closer and closer to something that would work. And then he tested it each, all the way up to the 100 inch blank, and everything worked. But they would need 20 tons of glass support the fill mold. And he had the most experienced labor. They tested it, they practiced it over and over and over again. There was somebody watching every step of the process to make sure nobody got in each other's way because you do not want to have problems when you're dealing with tons and tons of molten glass. It was hot at hell in that place. And these men were not wearing any special clothes. They were wearing ordinary street clothes, ordinary shoes. <coughs> Uh, there was no motion in those days. It was very, very simple and quite hazardous. Now, there was no way they could keep this a secret. The telescope grant, the process of the huge telescope, everything was new to the media. And Lowell Thomas got involved, and he wanted to be there to watch this pouring, and there was no way pouring could avoid it. And Lowell Thomas, in his typical hyperbole, that the greatest item of interest in 25 years not to exclude the World War. So, a lot of people came to Corning to watch this pour, and special platforms were set up, and the crowds were brought in a certain place, and they could watch this process be done. Macaulay was trying to deal with it all at the same time. All he wanted to do was pour the perfect mirror. But as the crowd went on and there was, everybody had to take breaks and they had to keep moving, they started to run into problems. About halfway through, some of the mold cores started popping loose and floating to the surface. And they had to be, they had to stop the pouring process and pull those mold cores out. And as time went on, it became more and more difficult. So on March 25th, 1934, they spent nearly 24 hours pouring the glass to fill that mold. And every time one of those mold cores popped loose, it meant they would need more glass because they would have to fill in that missing spot. After it was all done, the molds are actually on the main floor of the factory. And the screw hoist underneath lowered the mold out of the kiln 
and moved it on tracks over to where the annealing oven is, and then raised it up to fit under the annealing oven. And that's where it would have to stay under controlled temperature condition for a full year. It needed an entire year to anneal 20 tons of glass. Now, Macaulay knew there were problems with it, but he couldn't do anything. He had to hope that they managed to salvage the mirror and that it would still work. But he wouldn't know for a very long time. So that's the process of moving it over. Now this was no longer in the public eye. When the public had gone, and all Macaulay could do now was wait and see how it came out. It didn't work. When they had, it had cooled off enough for them to look at it, the surface of the mirror was a pitted, rocky mess with pieces of the mold cores embedded in it. There was no way they could save it. And he told the observatory council that it was a failure, but he was sure they could do it again. Then the observatory council, that already spent less than they had spent on GE, agreed to let him do another one. And so they tried it again, and this time everything went perfectly. Partly because the media and the crowd weren't there to distract them. And once the, mold was, once the new mirror had been cast, it went into the annealing oven, and they had to wait a full year. And he had people who were supposed to be there in shift 24 hours a day for a full year. And their job was to watch the thermocouple and the setting to make sure that the mold only cooled and annealed one degree per day for the first three months, and then half a degree per day for the next three months and so on, until it reached room temperature. Now there was a near disaster about a month or so before the annealing oven would have been open, when the river that ran through Corning overflowed and went above its banks for the first time in something like half a century, and the water came into the factory. And it threatened to short out the, the transformer that powered the annealing oven. And so it was a frantic effort by the entire factory and the entire town to block off that river, to get cranes in there and cut holes in the floor. And they had to hoist the transformers out with a, with a crane in order to keep it away from the rising water. And they just barely made it. It was that close. But at last, after a full year, they opened the annealing oven, and they had it, a perfect mirror. Now this will give you an idea how big that mirror is. You're looking at the, at the waffle pattern in the back of it. And the, um, that is Macaulay up there in the, uh, the central hole. That shows you how big that thing is. That 20 ton of pure glass. Now, I don't know if any of you, I'm betting none of you are old enough to remember this. 1935, when the mirror was being transported across the country to Pasadena, where they were going to work on it. This was a huge media event. They had it cranked up and put on a special train that would take two weeks to travel across the country. It was called the Journey of the Giant Eye. A lot of people thought it was a lens. They didn't really understand that it was supposed to be a mirror. And a special train that had to take a certain route so that it would be able to get underneath the uh, bridges and anything else. And this was such a big event that schools were let out People gathered along the track to watch this thing go by. It pushed the, uh, the Bruno Richard Hoffman trial of the Lindbergh baby kidnapping off the front pages. It was a huge event to watch this thing travel across the country. You can find lots about it in old newspapers. And at last it arrived in Pasadena, and that's where they were going to begin to work on it. The optics shop on California Street, which is still there, is just a building the size of a Costco. 200 feet long, 60 feet wide, 40 feet high, with a 60 foot traveling crane at the top, and a grinding machine, and ultra clean condition. They can't have any dust, they can't have any grit, dirt, anything that will scratch this mirror while it's being ground, figured, and polished. And the two men that were most in charge were John Anderson of the Observatory Council and Marcus Brown, who had been working with grinding telescopes since he was a kid. Marcus Brown, this would be his magnum opus, this would be his greatest achievement. 
he had waited for 10 years to have the opportunity to grind the 200 inch telescope mirror. And he was a fanatic about it. Everything had to be perfect, everything he had to, it had to be absolutely clean. That mirror went into the optic shop, the doors closed, and they were not reopened for 11 years. The first thing they had to do was to remove five tons of glass from the top surface of it and make it absolutely flat to get down to pure flat glass. That would require about two years. <coughs> So this machine, which was as big as the did itself, about 18 feet in diameter, um, had to be watched by a team of Marcus Brown people. They watched it as the grinding machine used glass block and carborundum as a, as a grinding powder and slurry and water running over it again and again in a slow process. Now the grinding glass is excruciatingly slow. You don't see any progress in a few hours or even a few days, and sometimes only in a few weeks when you see maybe an eighth of an inch of glass removed. Excruciatingly slow process, but it has to be absolutely perfect. You cannot take any chances with it. So the, cur the table itself would revolve counterclockwise while the grinding machine that held the black blocks that were doing the grinding rotated in a clockwise, so it was an epicyclic rotation. And this assured an absolutely smooth grinding surface as the table rotated underneath it. Now every single day, Marcus Brown had the floor vacuumed and they went over it with magnets. They all had to wear special clothes if they found a single slight shaving of metal from a machine, they had to figure out where it came from. Because it's bad enough finding it on the floor. The one thing they did not want to find was to have it on the surface of the glass. Because if they're working on it and they hear a little screech, that might be six months of work law if they had to grind out the scratch. After two years of grinding it flat, then they began to work on carving and cutting the parabola the actual curve that made it into a telescope mirror. And that parabola had a curvature of 111 feet. It's very shallow. It's almost impossible to see when you're looking at it. But that parabola had to be absolutely perfect, not only in its dimensions and curvature, but in its smoothness. And as slow as the process had been up to this point, it became even more slow. In fact, six months might remove a millimeter of glass. And they were down to looking at very small areas and grinding them and polishing them, smaller and smaller. He was no longer using carborundum. He was using emery and stuff that was like talcum powder to as a grinding powder. So all this was, while this was going on, things were heating up around the world. The Second World War was already raging in Europe. And there was no doubt the United States was going to get into it sooner or later. Now that they actually had a mirror, it was possible to actually build a telescope. Now the design of the Hale telescope was one of the most radical designs. They couldn't use the same system that had been used in previous telescopes. They wanted <laughs> and they were going to have to use something that had never been done before, a completely different radical design. Well, George Hale did not live to see his project comes to life. He did not live to see the telescope built. But on the last day of his life, he was rolled out in his wheelchair, and he looked up into the sun, towards the sun, and said, the sun is shining and they are working on Palomar. After that, it was, a, it was a given that it would be named after him. There was an artist named Russell Porter who worked on the project, and he had signed on only to work for a year, but he ended up spending about six years on the project. Russell Porter had this incredible ability to take blueprints and turn them into three-dimensional drawing. Because building the telescope was something that was so complex that a lot of people could not understand what it would actually look like, how it would actually work just from the blueprint. And so he created a series of drawings which are on display up at, up at the telescope and also at the Caltech Optics Lab in Pasadena, where you can see how the telescope would actually be put together, what it, what it would actually look like. 
And then for many people, this was the first time they thought, oh, now I get it. So up on the mountain itself, the hail had picked Palomar Mountain out of about 15 different sites that were all somewhat suitable. Mount Wilson was still had the best sea, the clearest sky, but he wanted a place that was separate, and he had gone up to Palomar, and he had been amazed at how beautiful, how stark and clear it was up there. He said it was like a hanging garden above the arid desert. And he had decided that that would be his choice for the place. And it would end up, ended up being chosen, but it made him happy to know that Palomar was the site of the observatory. While the mirror was being ground, figured, and polished, the site construction was going on and actually building the telescope. They had to tear away thousands of tons of distressed, decomposed granite in order to to build a strong foundation for the observatory and telescope mount. When the war started, everything had to be shut down in the optic lab because they were needed for war work. And so the mirror was crated up and set aside, and all Brown could do was look at it over in the corner while he worked on optics for uh, naval guns and for uh, telescope for uh, periscope for submarine and a lot of other projects. And he was waiting for the day when the war would end and he could get back to the work he really wanted. So building the dome, and putting the, they built the dome first as the, the parts of the telescope were being built. Now everything had to be brought up. Once the site had been chosen, San Diego County improved and built the road that goes up there, the, the Nate Harrison Grave that goes up there. And that, uh, that's the road you still drive to go up to Palomar. All the big parts of the telescope, the mount, all the, all the construction material, all the uh, concrete, everything had to be trucked up that grade, up to, the, up to the observatory site. That dome rotates. But, um, you probably have had it, if you've had the opportunity to see it actually turning. There can't be any vibration in the, in the telescope mount. There can't be any vibration in the, in the dome. Because as the telescope is going through its motion while it's turning to accommodate the rotation of the Earth while it's being used, and the dome rotates, that dome has to move smoothly without any vibration being translated to the telescope. And they spent six months grinding the rail that goes around the dome. And they did it with such precision, so smooth. Bear in mind, this is 1939 to 1946. They did it so smoothly that when the Observatory Council went up to look at the dome, and they went up onto that rail there to stand inside the dome, and they said, go ahead, turn it on, let's see it work. And the dome started to rotate. They could not feel it moving. They were swore, they swore the, the floor was turning underneath them. They could not feel the dome moving. That's how smooth the job was. Because Hale had been given the opportunity to make the most perfect telescope in the world, and they had taken it seriously. The telescope would weigh 500 tons, 1 million pounds. And the, um, the mount, the yoke, the south bearing, Everything was being made at Westinghouse. And it had to have absolutely perfect control, perfect motion. It could not have any vibration. One of the biggest things, how do you move something that weighs 500 tons without having huge motors that are going to add all kinds of vibration? And so the most innovative ideas came along. This telescope is so perfectly balanced that that horseshoe bearing, that's the largest welded construction in the world at the time. And when that was used, it, it had to be so perfectly balanced that it could not impart any, balance, any um, vibration into the telescope that would be translated to the mirror and screw up any industry. That horseshoe bearing was so perfectly balanced on a pad of thin oil on the journal bearing that they said that you could put a milk bottle on one end of that horseshoe bearing and it would roll and it would move the telescope. They couldn't wait to actually try it, but it's probably true. So just a few drops of oil in the fill in the area between the horseshoe bearing and the journal bearing and the south 
and the, the South Polar Bear was all it required to move it. They were actually able to move and swing that telescope with a, a motor of less than six horsepower. And even more, everybody coming, kept coming up with wonderful ideas. You needed to have bearings that would support the telescope too, which was over 100 feet long and 56, uh, 56 feet long and 18 feet in diameter. And they needed, it, it needed to be on bearing to support the weight, but not distort as that telescope too pivoted up and down from horizon to zenith. So one designer, a young Swiss designer named Ryan Kroon, came up with the idea of using bicycle folk declination bearing. The same thing you use in your bicycle wheel. Because the, um, the one that is in tension canceled out the one that is in compression. And they're still in place. They still work perfectly. And they turned out to be the perfect bearing for the telescope too. St. Clair Smitty Smith, spent, he was dying of cancer at the time, and he was desperate to finish the control mechanism for the telescope before his death. He didn't quite make it. It was finished about two weeks after his death. But he had designed a control system that is still in operation today. It's not computer controlled. But this control board allowed an astronomer to set the position of the telescope, its mo moving rate, where it was supposed to be pointed and how much it would move as the Earth rotated. I'm talking about incredible precision here. Now, the telescope had to be able to go from Zenith straight up to the horizon and be able to turn in an area, if you imagine, about one quarter of a slice of an orange. Everything within this area and this area had to be able to turn within that and to within a one second of arc. Now there are, 30, there are 360 degrees in a circle and there are 60 minutes of arc in each degree and there's 60 seconds of arc in each minute. One arc second is 1,295,000 of a circle. And that's how precise that telescope had to be to hold its image on a specific star or galaxy in the distance. Something you can't even see with the naked eye. And so he designed a system that would move the telescope with this control system. It was completely innovative, never been done before. But they had the money to make it a perfect machine, and he gave his dedicated his life to making it work, and it still works. So one of the biggest problems was the truss that would hold the, the actual telescope mirror. The Surrier, Mark Surrier came up with an idea, because this great big tube that's 56 feet long, it's going to bend and being held in the center where, the, where the, the, the bearings are. And if it bends from its own weight at either end, the telescope and the uh, prime focus are going to be out of angle with each other. They'll be flexed away, and it will not get a perfect optical path. So he spent months working on the idea, and he finally figured out that he couldn't avoid the tube sagging, but he could design a tube that would sag would shear instead of flex. So they would both sag, but they would still be in alignment with each other, and this would provide an optically, optically perfect path. And when he presented it to the observatory council, they were stunned and said, God, we never thought of that. That's the perfect solution. So one by one, all the problems, all the problems that they had anticipated with building this immense telescope were being taken care of one by one, which is unbelievable innovation and ingenuity. Now once the, mirror, the uh, entire telescope had been built, they had to test it. They had to work it through paces and get it working properly and learn all of its foibles and its quirk. And so before the actual mirror was put in, they cast a 20-ton dummy mirror of concrete and they fitted that into the mirror cage at the bottom of the telescope mount. So this way would be a counterweight that would take the place of the mirror while the telescope was actually under construction and being tested. When the mirror would be drawn into the mountain, that was going to be discarded. And that's exactly what they did. In 1946, they finally pulled that, mirror, that uh, dummy telescope mirror out. That is now still sitting there. The back of the dome, if you take the walkway around the back of the dome, you'll see this immense circular thing. It looks like 
It looks like the Oracle of Delphi, it's a great big concrete slab, and you won't even notice if you're not paying attention. But that is the dummy mirror, and that shows you how big the real thing was. It's more than 17 feet in diameter. Well, after that was laid out there, some way nobody has ever admitted to it, put a sign next to that mirror for all the turrets that were coming up, just for the fun of it. This sign. <laughs> well, turned out not to be a good idea because some woman who apparently had a deep streak of xenophobia in it screamed and ran. She went to the ranger station and demanded that he take from the march. <laughs> so they took the time down. <laughs> At last the mirror was ready. At last the mirror was done. It was figured, it was polished. They had been polishing down to area only a quarter inch in size. And they were doing it with, a, with cork and a few drops of water and carborundum or emery, just to touch up a few spots and they would wait and then test the mirror. That's how perfect it was. You want to know how perfect that surface is? It is perfect to within two millionths of an inch a wavelength of light. And if the mirror was enlarged to the size of the United States, the largest bump on it would be less than six inches high. And that was done using 1930 to 1940 technology. So then they had to bring it up the mountain, up the Nate Harrison grade. And three big trucks of the Bellier Brothers trucking company were used to bring it up. And it would, they, they went up so slowly you could walk alongside those trucks. One was pulling, one was carrying the mirror, and one was pushing to get it up that grade. Up the switchback, up and back and forth. It took an entire day, 18 hours, to get it up to the, the, uh, the dome. But so now the dome, now the mirror has been brought in to the dome and it's going to be mounted. Now it has not yet been illuminized. It just polished so perfectly that it can still do the job, it can be used for the first optical test to make sure that it works properly and that the mirror supports and everything will do their job. Now this is actually the 100 inch, but it, I, it's, a, it's a photograph that shows you at least to give you an idea. You see that man sitting there, and well, all he's doing is touching up an area that's probably the size of a postage stamp to remove a slight irregularity in the glass surface. But that's what they were doing with the 200 inch mirror at this point. Marcus Brown was not involved with anything up on the mountain. He had done his job at Pasadena. His knees were gone. He couldn't work on telescope mirrors anymore. But he had created his magnum opus. He had created the perfect telescope mirror. And it had taken him 11 years to do it. So the last step was to illuminate the mirror, to give it the mirror surface. Now, unlike a a bathroom mirror, which has a surface of glass and then the aluminum, the, the reflecting surfaces on the back side. This is on the surface of the mirror, <coughs> which means it can oxidize. And so they had a huge aluminizing oven with a vacuum seal inside it. And they filled it with powdered aluminum in the air, in the, that was suspended inside the vacuum. And it was allowed to drift down and adhere to the surface of the mirror. That took several tries because to draw down a vacuum on a base that big was almost impossible. They kept running around the whack and the early version of duct tape trying to close up all the little holes so they could get a perfect vacuum before the illuminization finally finished. After three tries, that was the finished result. Now that is a work of art. That is a perfect mirror and it will reflect the entire universe. It was brought into place, and after some more testing, now you see the telescope and you see all the little ants under it, those are the people that are there to dedicate it. And among them is Albert Einstein and his wife. And when Mrs. Einstein would ask about what do you think about your husband's work being supported by this massive telescope, because this telescope is going to answer all the questions of the universe. And Mrs. Einstein said, oh, my husband does that in the back of an envelope. <laughs> but the telescope finally went into service, 
When it was first tested by none other, none left than Edwin Hubble himself, and he went up in the defined focus cage at the very top of the mirror and looked down, and he saw the universe at his feet. A black surface, an absolutely ebony, ebony black surface, dusted with stars that seemed to float in space underneath it. It was first light for the Palomar Telescope. Well, it has been in operation since 1948, and it has managed to answer some of the questions of cosmology, to see farther into the universe than any telescope since. Now, it has long since been eclipsed by larger telescopes using ballistic mirrors, radio telescopes, and it has gone through a lot of changes in technology, but it still works. It is still one of the most perfect optical machine ever built. So, Palomar has already long since outlived many of the other telescopes. It's still in operation, but it has still has a lot of surprises for us. This is a photo from the Deep Sky Survey that Palomar has been participating in for the last 20 years, in which they are mapping the entire northern hemisphere. Every galaxy, every star, every nebula that they could possibly do it. And mapping in section by section. Now you see all the stars and nebula and galaxies in this picture, all the spirals. That, the area of that photo, if you take a grain of sand and held it at arm's length, that's how much space is in that photo. And that's what the Palomar Star Sky Survey is. It's an incredibly complex universe. It's an unbelievably beautiful universe with so many things to see in. Now, I'm going to answer the question. Measuring cup have to do with the scale of the universe. Because after the failed experiment at GE, George Hale went to Corning, New York, to work with that new borosilicate glass. That borosilicate glass that turned out to be the perfect material for the Palomar 200 inch telescope mirror. Pyrex. <laughs> so the next time you're in your kitchen and you pick up that measuring cup or that mixing bowl or that baking dish, bear in mind you're actually holding a piece of scientific and astronomical history in your hand. Do the universe a favor, don't drop it. <laughs> Thank you all very, very much.
has come up with different ways to look out for um, forest fires and to prevent them, obviously. You've heard Smokey the Bear only used to prevent forest fires. But since the early 1900s, they have had forest fire lookout towers all over the country, all over the national forest. And in the 1960s, they started phasing those out. There are two up on Palomar Mountain that were phased out and sat dormant for a long time. And that's been eclipsed by technology of uh, satellite technology and imagery and cameras and so on and so forth. But when it all comes down to it, there's still nothing better than a set of eyes to early detect a forest fire. And I can't think of any more important place to for early detection of forest fire than Palomar Mountain. Uh, back in 1990, a uh, national organization was formed called the Forest Fire Lookout Association. And uh, their goal was to uh, preserve and restore and start manning some of the Forest Fire Lookout uh, towers again. There are two on Palmer Mountain that go back to the 1920s and 1930s. And for years, they were set abandoned and vandalized look like they would ever be in use again. And then in about 2008, the uh, San Diego Riverside chapter of the Forest Fire Lookout Association was formed, and their first goal were to restore and start manning the two lookout towers on Palomar Mountain. They've been in uh, operation since 2009. It's all staffed by volunteers, of which I'm proud to say that I'm one. I started with them this year. We have two beautiful towers that have been restored. We man them all throughout the fire season, and our job is to watch for smoke and spot that fire in time for the forest fire uh, crews to get out there and stop that fire before it gets out of control. I have some photos here showing the, the history of them, uh, some of the old towers of what they look like. Here's Lions Peak in San Diego County, what it looked like in 1913, what it looks like today. Uh, we have the two on Palomar Mountain. We have High Point. What's really, really great about working at the High Point Tower, it's way up the dirt road. It's up past the Palomar Mountain Observatory. It's 67 feet high. It's the highest spot on Palomar Mountain. The, the views are incredible, but uh, it's just a couple of miles from the observatory, and we keep the observatory under watch all the time, all the surrounding area. And if we see a fire starting, we're going to get it reported, get fire crews here before it gets out of control and causes a problem for the folks on Palomar Mountain. Uh, then the other one that we have is Booker Hill. Here's some pictures of it way back when, when it was first built, and then it was just fallen into ruin, and the association has rebuilt it and restored it, and now they man it. That one is open for tours every day during the fire season. If you drive up to Palmar Mountain, you'll see the observatory. Take a little side trip to the state park, find a Booker Hill uh, fire lookout, and take a tour of it. Take a look at it and see our million dollar views. You can see all the way to Coronado Island from up there on the top of the state park. Uh, anybody have any questions after the presentation's over? I'll be happy to answer them and show the display boards a little bit. And thanks for your time and thanks for coming to the air. Okay. Well, I heard Alan was up there doing that. God, somebody with good eyes is doing it. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. Well, okay, only a couple minutes over. Did you have any questions? Yes, back here. Um, Six million dollars. Yeah. Was it invested and you lived off the income, or is how much was spent with that six million dollars? Well, six million dollars, what? But did you invest it, or how much of it was spent? They, they used it all up. Um, the, the grant was for the construction of the telescope that we had, the entire observatory, and to put it into operation, and any ancillary equipment that would be necessary, which included the, the Schmidt telescope, which is the survey telescope, um, everything. But they went through that just about the time the mirror reached the mountain. That was when they were, they last ran out of money. And so they went through, because the Rockefeller Foundation had provided that initial grant. The Carnegie Foundation, which paid for the Mount Wilson Observatory, 
there was, there was actually a conflict of interest there, agreed to help pay for the operation, to put the telescope in operation, because it wouldn't do any much good to build the thing and then say, well, now we don't have any money to run it. So Carnegie put the money into operating it. And I think they were one and a half million dollars into the Carnegie model, one before they were able to, to work out the deal. So Mount Wilson, Caltech, and Palomar are all in the same uh, groups now as far as operation. So it, it caused some problems with the uh, uh, the rest of the, the world of astronomy around the country because they called it the Southern California Click. Because the three biggest telescopes in the world were all in Southern California, and if you wanted to take pictures of the deep sky, you had to go to Southern California to do it. And, there was a, there was, and remember Harlow Shapley? By this time, he went off to Chicago because he had a fight with them and he left. And he started slanging. Palomar, say, it'll never work, they'll never get it to work. You, know, you need to come to me, I'll, I'll show you how to build a good telescope. So, uh, but yeah, they, they ate up that money, and of course, so much of it went to GE, which was just wasted money. Interestingly, though, GE eventually did perfect the Hughes Sport process, and it is now used for a lot of telescope mirrors. But it took them another 30, 40 years before they got it right. Mark? Yes. Um, when I think of Pasadena and Southern California, I think of earthquakes. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is there a suspended base? How, how do they keep, how did they keep the glass safe from underneath in case of earthquakes? How did they what? How did they keep the, the glass, the, you know, telescope glass uh, suspended so that in case of an earthquake, it wouldn't crash? Oh, the earthquake were a real Concern. Um, John Anderson, who was head of the observatory council, was in charge of the whole pro project. Uh, he lay awake at night, think, why is an earthquake strike? Well, the mirror is up on its eagle. Because when they would test the mirror, they had to bring it into a vertical position so that they could focus light on it from 200 feet away. And he was deathly afraid of what would happen if an earthquake struck at that moment. Um, it never did. It ne they never had an earthquake that caused the problem for the, the work at the time. They were just lucky. Pure luck. Yeah. But yeah, they, they were, the whole time they were. What was the base? Did they have it suspended? Was it on? Yeah, it was, there was a 60 ton crane that helped. But oh. you see, they, they raised it into a vertical position and it had it, and they had it in a sling that was attached to the bolts around it Good. and held it in place. Thank you. Yeah, so that, that's all it was. But when they had it in the eagle, it was locked into place so that it would be absolutely perfect so they could get the optical path. How about and today, Mark? How about uh, in operation? Today, um, they, still, they still take the mirror out of the cage um, about once every five years to re-illuminize it and repolish it. How about earthquake protection? What do they have? They just, well, I mean, it's going to shake, I don't know, if a major earthquake strikes, they, that'll just that's something not to deal with. But as far as I know, it's never been an issue. So it's uh, it's just one of those, one of those things. So the mirror has taken a few little damage over the years. Somebody dropped a wrench on it once. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, I think it would be that guy with a tiny little chip. <laughs> Considering how big it is, a tiny little chip or dent didn't do anything to damage an optical. Perfect. Slide pollution Yeah. Uh, you notice all the um, the pink, uh, what is it, argon that they use in uh, street lights and stuff? One of the reasons that was done wasn't just for energy saving, was because of all the light pollution was really screwing things up for the Mount Wilson Observatory and for Palomar. And so, um, then Eagle County agreed to start using argon light because it really cut down on that white haze. Uh, to, to make to make it better to see because you know obviously these things can only work at night. Question in the back here. Pardon? Question back here. Yeah. Oh, it's me. Me. Okay. Yeah. So it's um the, uh, it's still a a piece of pride with San Diego County to have that to come to here. Yeah. It's still one. It's, it's still the most perfectly built astronomical unit uh, telescope in the world. It still works perfectly. You know, it's 60 years old, 70 years old now. 
Another question in the back, Mark. What that? Question in the back. Yeah. What that? Okay. Back here. Oh, man. That's that's okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I didn't hear that. Can, okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Move up. A little bit. Okay. Yeah, I'll try to. Okay. Question for you. Uh, along the trail of the Vulcan Mountain, there's a little the ruins of a little cabin up there, and the sign indicates that that was one of the uh, the, the possible sites for the observatory where uh, they would send someone up to do some observations. And I'm wondering how many of those little cabins were there, and how long were the guys there, and what kind of observations were they making uh, to finally de decide on Palomar site? He was up there several times a year, a couple weeks at a time. And he had a special instrument that was like a surveyor transit, in which he would test the seeing in different parts of the year. And he would stay up there, he camped up there and made sure, and he had to do this for all the sites that they were looking at, the ones in Arizona and Colorado, and Mexico and South America, to, to find the perfect site. And so he was up there testing the seeing every night to make sure that it was perfect. And I think that there's a, there's a marker or something there showing yes. where he had actually worked. Yeah, so, uh, but at that time there was nothing, it was just a few cabins and people who lived up in that area and the people who lived in the French Valley and so on. But yeah, that was, that was an important part. And then when all those reports came down, it was decided that uh, Panama was the perfect site for that mirror. Is the question up front? It's what? I, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, it's not only really construction, but with the Hubble Space Telescope and they both do deep space, mm -hmm. how do they coordinate which telescope does what? Well, Palomar was <coughs> being used for the Deep Sky Survey to actually map out the heaven. Um, the, there are astronomers that work with what they would call dark sky, where they can get, uh, where, they work, where they can work where there's no moon, and they can get the most deep Sky sort of uh, looks at distant galaxies, the nebula, or redshift, and they could. I think in 1970, 69 or 70, they 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 took a photograph of the most distant galaxy ever seen, and it was something like six trillion light light years away, and they got a good picture of it. So it was being used for all that, but it was also being used for the, for the sky survey, which when Hubble went into operation, could, so they'd know where, where, where to point Hubble. They would say, okay, we're gonna look at here, we're gonna look at here, we're gonna look at this, where Hubble went into operation. They made use of what was done at Palomar. Now, in the old days, astronomers had to actually go to the mountain. They had to make an appointment, they would get, and say, okay, you're gonna have three nights in January or whatever. And he had to go up there and work in the freezing cold. And I mean it was cold. When that dome was open in January, you were bundled up, you were up there in the focus cage, breathing your tail off and hoping your bladder held out for the six, eight hours of a, of a particular exposure. But now you can do it from your living room or from your office at home. You just set it up if you get if you have the time on it. They bring the telescope over, they take the picture they want, they email it to you, and, you, and you're done. It's good work. So it's not quite as romantic as you <laughs> But uh, all that equipment is still there. And uh, if you get up there and you, and you take the tour and you look around, it, it, it's amazing. And you look up at that immense machine hanging over your head. It's huge. It is. It's just unbelievable that that thing will work the way it was taken for power. The question in front of the question, question mark. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, sure. Yeah. I don't know if you know the answer to this, but with all the experience they had with mirrors, how did they screw up the space station mirror? <laughs> with all the experience, you know, how did they screw up the Hubble? Um, believe it or not, it was a mathematical error in that they had not accounting for the fact that it would be in zero gravity. When they made that mirror, it was on Earth. And the meniscus mirror that actually makes up the, uh, the, 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 the Hubble space telescope mirror, when it got into orbit and it was in zero gravity, it, it couldn't hold its figure because it wasn't in a gravi gravitational field. It, it's more complex than that, but that was the basic idea. So 
was just one of the didn't even think of it. Uh, so it, it was, fortunately, they were able to fix it. But it was, it was kind of a slap in the face for NAFTA because they didn't deserve it, and uh, they ended up doing a beautiful job of, of getting it into operation. And of course, the photos from Hubble are stunning, and how far it seen it was, it can do some beautiful things. It's kind of like a really beautiful universe. It's just incredible, and I know that it proved that there has to be a greater intelligence than humanity, and it wasn't created just for us. Because that's only in the last 20, 30 years have we seen how big the universe is. It wasn't just created for us. That would be a waste of space. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't even know about all that out there, and they're still reaching out into the defined how far it goes. So, yeah, the health humble, I think, was a, a, a scientific triumph. It's just, well, it had a little astigmatism in the beginning, so they put a pair of glasses and gave it some by the end of Mark, okay. thank you so much. Uh, I handed out some brochures if you'd like to take one from one of your friends and encourage them. We have these uh, speakers every month. They're also being videotaped, so if you missed any of the details, uh, I saw some people taking notes. You could look at uh, RV history on YouTube for, uh, and you know catch those little details. Uh, I thank you very much for being here. It was a marvelous presentation. I can't help thinking of War of the Worlds, inspiring that poor lady to be scared to death, because I remember I was scared to death when yeah, I saw it. Yeah, it was only a few years ago. so very much for being here. If you'd like to make a small donation to our cause to keep us going, we'd appreciate that as well.